Good evening, comrades. Welcome to tonight's session um, above of my marks. Tonight, Ian Spencer will be looking at Marx, Engels, and the French Workers' Party, also touching on uh, the beginnings of the Second International, I believe, and will no doubt have also a discussion about minimum maximum versus transitional program. Um, as always, we have an introduction. And then if you want to get involved in the discussion or ask a question, please go to reactions and raise hand or put it in the chat that you would like to ask a question. Hello, Ian. Thanks for joining. Good evening, comrades. Uh, this has given me quite a bit of pleasure to, to read this. It's a... Uh, <laughs> It's quite extraordinary to think about the beginnings of the Second International and the parties that made up its constituent bodies, as it were. Um, some of the themes I'm going to have a look at are the conflicts between reformist and revolutionary ideas, the nature of the party as opposed to syndicalism, and we have a session later on on syndicalism, which I'll probably be covering as well. And um, the connection of parties uh, to each other in different countries, the whole question around internationalism is, of course, suffused through uh, the whole beginnings of the, the Second International. I will start, though, uh, with a reference back. This, in a sense, is a continuation of my session on Karl Marx and the anarchists, Marx, Engels and the anarchists. Because, as you'll see, uh, many of the people who played leading roles in different sections of the French Workers' Party had emerged from a, an anarchist tradition. Uh, some subsequently became Marxists, and some Marxists su subsequently became national chauvinists. Um, so the whole question as well is, is about the relationship between Marx and Engels and, and the, the Engels in particular with the development of the Second International. And um, I'll move towards the conclusion uh, with a consideration about for something so widespread as the caving in of uh, workers' parties across Europe to the interests of their own respective bourgeoisie, um, if for that to be such a universal feature could not, has to have some kind of explanation and we'll move towards that. Okay then, so let's go back a moment to the split in the second, in the first international. Um, in 1872, uh, the Hague Congress of the, of the First International expelled uh, Bakunin and James Guillaume, um, and in large part because uh, they had effectively set up an association within the association. Um, they had, uh, following uh, the um, uh, Paris Commune, uh, and uh, criticisms leveled at Bakunin and Bakunin's um, opposition to what he regarded as Marx's authoritarianism within the First International. Um, Mikhail Bakunin um, found himself in Switzerland and uh, helped to establish the Jura Federation uh, in, in Switzerland. Um, it's interesting really to consider once again the kind of paradoxes with uh, many of the anarchists. Um, so Bakunin in his writings often exalts the uh, lumpen proletariat, the declasse elements, the poorest of the poor within the working class. Um, but on the other hand, um, the Jura Federation, for example, were predominantly artisans. Uh, the Jura Federation were often watchmakers and Swiss watchmakers, facing competition from overseas uh, were combining together as craft workers rather than the lumpen proletariat that Bakunin professed to be to be such an important revolutionary part of of, of society so the criticisms were leveled against Bakunin and Guillaume in uh, the 1871 uh, London conference congress and um the other thing that cropped up was the case of Sergei Nechayev. Um, Nechayev was an associate of Bakunin. Bakunin subsequently tried to distance himself from him, but um, the Council of 
uh, the first international had no qualms whatsoever about bringing up the question of Nechayev. Nechayev was a um, Russian nihilist and supposed anarchist who had been uh, responsible for killing someone in, in back in Russia, and his association with Bakunin was used in a sense uh, as if any more evidence was needed about the uh, dangerous nature of Bakunin and Guillaume's interest in forming secretive associations within the International Working Men's Association. So initially the Jura Federation formed the kind of basis of uh, for, for, for the anarchists uh, in, in the period after 1871, uh, up to 1871. But then um, by 1872, when the split was, was finalized, um, another um, Congress, uh, Sandemia in, uh, in Switzerland, effectively established an anarchist international as a as a, an opposition to uh, the sub supposedly statist international uh, of of the international working men's association and at the heart of all of that um was as i mentioned when we're talking about marx and the anarchists an abstention from the political process uh, an idea of um direct action rather than um engaging in, in in the political process in any way. Um, Pyotr Kropotkin, uh, who I mentioned in uh, the session on Marx and the Anarchists, but who didn't have any real contact with Marx, uh, but I said I'd mention him because he would crop up again. Um, Kropotkin uh, really effectively became the kind of leader of, of, of anarchism and one of the more erudite writers on anarchism in the period after the death of Bakunin in 1876. And Kropotkin had visited uh, Jura uh, and was very impressed with the um, cooperation uh, of uh, the uh, Jura watchmakers and other artisans that he found there in Switzerland. So that's just a little bit of the background, a little bit of the background to why uh, the anarchists were expelled and part of the reason for the, the split in the first international. Um, in the period after the uh, uh, slaughter of the Paris Commune in 1871, um, Marx, who had argued that the communards shouldn't try to take power because he could see that they would almost certainly be overwhelmed and it would set the workers' movement back some years, was proven right because uh, it wasn't until 1879 that there was the establishment of a, a federation of socialist workers of France. Um, the, the whole experience of um, the putative revolution in the Paris Commune um, meant that there was a, a reticence about engaging in revolutionary activity. So the emphasis was very much upon gradual reforms. And ironically, uh, it was led by former anarchists. Um, Paul Brousset and Benoit Malon um, were leading figures within um, the Federation of uh, Socialist Workers of France. But there was also a left, uh, uh, which was led by Jules Guide and Paul Lafargue. And Paul Lafargue, um, was married to Laura Marx, the daughter of Karl Marx. And um, the, the correspondence of, of Marx and Engels is, is full of references to Guide and Lafargue uh, and also uh, Brousset and Malon, um, some of which is not terribly complimentary to any of them. Um, but in particular, uh, the invective is leveled at uh, Brousset and Malon. So what you effectively end up with by 1902 is two socialist parties of France, one called the uh, Parti Socialiste Française, uh, which was later led by Jean Jaurès, uh, which was originally led by Paul Brousset, uh, and then the Parti Socialiste de France, uh, led by Gide, uh, Gide uh, and, 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 and a former Blanquist, uh, Edouard Vaillant. Um, so two parties uh, vying, in a sense, for uh, the, the the unity of the French working class against capitalism, uh, the possibilists uh, around um, uh, around achievable reforms that could be won uh, in 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 the not too distant future. Um, possibilists is one way of of reading it, and that's usually the way it's so another way is to say that it's opportunist. Uh, what we're seeing here in among the possibilists is the idea that 
you put forward a program based upon the most likely things that people are to vote for or, or you'll win electoral success. And note here then um, the paradox. Uh, um, Brousset and Malon were both uh, anarchists, uh, both uh, f followers initially of Proudhon, but also subsequently Bakunin. And here they are concerning themselves with uh, what kind of position can we take within an electoral system uh, that will secure the growth of the party. And so the idea of the party and its fortunes being tied to electoral success uh, is an intrinsic part of the possibilist program. By contrast, the Parti Socialiste de France, led by Guide and former Blanquist Ed Edouard Veillon, um, both Veillon and um, uh, Benoit Malon were, were both communards, and I'll come on to them uh, in, in a moment. Uh, by contrast, we're putting forward the, the politics of, of revolutionary class struggle. And let's meet a few of these people a bit more closely. This is Paul Brousset. He uh, was an educated man. He studied medicine. He joined the International Working Men's Association, but was active in, in about 1868, I understand. And he was active in the Jura Federation. Um, he worked with uh, Pyotr Kropotkin and James Guillaume uh, to help publish their work. Um, he was, uh, I believe, from Alsace um, and uh, was, was comfortable in both French and German. Um, and what he was advocating at the time was the propaganda of the deed, the idea that direct action itself could be the spark to revolution. Um, uh, however, uh, by 1880, uh, he returned to France and gradually became took a more and more reformist position, being um, a, a leader of the, the, the possibilist faction uh, within the French Socialist Workers' Party. Um, and he was also supported by Jean Jaurès, who I'll come on to later. Jaurès occupies a very uh, central place in the history of the French uh, Socialist Party. Um, one can't just simply lump him in with the possibilists, although he's closer to that than the revolutionary Marxists. Um, but I will consider him a little bit more separately because of his importance uh, in the story. So, Benoît Malon, um, those are his dates, uh, came from a, a, a poor peasant family uh, as an attempt to escape the crushing poverty of being a peasant in France, uh, initially enrolled in the seminary to study as a priest, but became radicalized uh, largely by studying Proudhon. Uh, and this is one of the important things, uh, as we'll see, even Guide uh, later on, uh, as we'll see, was originally an anarchist. Um, so, the, the influence of Proudhon, Proudhon and Bakunin, uh, although uh, one might argue that the, um, the, the split in the First International uh, eventually sort of put paid to the, the, the anarchist movement in, in Northern Europe, at least, um, in, in, it continued to exert an influence right up until the beginning of the 20th century and arguably beyond. Um, so. Um, it's always worth remembering that when we look at what some of the programs that were put forward. So uh, Malon uh, sided with Bakunin against Marx in the International Working Men's Association. Uh, he'd be joined the uh, first international having met Charles Longwy, who also married one of Marx's daughters. Um, uh, Malon was a communard, uh, but he managed to escape to Switzerland and, and surprise, surprise, joined the Jura Federation along with Kropotkin and all the others. Um, he returned to France in 1880 and joined the Parti Ouvrière. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, the Parti Ouvrière at the time was a, a faction, really, within the uh, Socialist Workers' Party of France. And Brousset, um, uh, true to form, um, uh, uh, Malon sided with Brousset against the Marxists in, in characteristic fashion. So the Parti Ouvrier uh, was really kind of created as a, as a faction in, in 1880, founded by Jules Guide and Paul Lafargue. Um, uh, Paul Lafargue, we'll come on to a little bit more in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> and in 1882, formally split from 
uh, the Socialist Party of France. The important thing here is that the the, the, the party, although Guide played a, a leading role in uh, Parti Ouvrier and the Socialist Party of France subsequently, um, he uh, uh, was in close contact with Marx and Engels, and uh, effectively the program of the French Communist Party, uh, the, the, the Parti Ouvrier, was dictated uh, by by Marx. Um, Marx wasn't an, um, completely impressed uh, by uh, Gide. Um, it, is, it is sometimes recognized by some people that, that Marx famously said that he's not a Marxist. Um, it was in relation to Gide and some of the other people within the French Communist Party. Um, so it, it was reported by Engels in a letter to Edouard Bernstein. Um, uh, what I'm it's in French, um, but what is certain is that I myself, basically saying, if 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 this is what being a Marxist is, what is certain is that I I myself am not a Marxist. Uh, it was reported by Engels in a letter to Bernstein um, on the basis of um, Marx's um, dealings with Guide and, and, and others within the Party of Rear. Notwithstanding that, he did um, write a, a superb program for um, the the. the, the the Workers' Party of France, um, and I'm going to—I don't normally do this, but I'm going to just read a couple of bits out uh, because it's so succinct, um, and I didn't want to just uh, stick it on a PowerPoint presentation. So here is the preamble uh, of uh, the the French Workers' Party, uh, dictated to Guide by Marx, considering that the emancipation of the productive class is that of all human beings without distinction of sex or race. Notice here, there is a huge step forward from the programme of the First International, which doesn't really mention uh, race or, or, or gender. It goes on. The producers can be free only when they are in possession of the means of production. But there are only two forms under which the means of production can belong to them. One, individual form, which has never existed in a general state and which is increasingly eliminated by industrial progress. Here, Marx is talking about personal possessions, as it were. Workers are already being dispossessed. Two, the collective form, the material and intellectual elements of which are constituted by the very development of capitalist society. He goes on. That this collective appropriation can arise only from the revolutionary action of the productive class or proletariat, organized as a distinct political party, that such an organization must be pursued by all means the proletariat has at its disposal, including universal suffrage, which will also thus be transformed from the instrument of deception that it has been up until now into an instrument of emancipation. The French socialist workers in adopting as the aim of their efforts the political and economic expropriation of the capitalist class and return to community of all the means of production have decided as a means of organization and struggle to enter the elections with the following immediate demands. So unequivocally revolutionary and unequivocally unashamed uh, of entering into elections on a class struggle basis. And the, the, what we then go on to is, is a, uh, a, a series of demands. So there are uh, five within uh, a the political section. And really, these are things which were originally part of the demands of the Paris Commune, such as um, the abolition, uh, abolition of standing armies, and, a, and the general arming of the people, um, the suppression of public debt. And importantly here, um, is a, is a direct reference to this um, abolishing those parts of the Code Napoleon which were concerned with establishing the inferiority of the worker in relation to the boss and of woman in relation to man. So a direct appeal to women workers as well. Um, what we then see uh, is the economic section, and I won't um, uh, read all of that out. There are 12 uh, um, uh, sections, paragraphs, um, but our journey is to try to draw attention to, to one, uh, five, equal pay for equal work of workers of both sexes. So here we are, uh, di a, a direct uh, uh, appeal to, to, to revolutionary socialism, um, a revolutionary transformation of society at large, uh, but with a willingness to use uh, uh, electoral means at its disposal.
So um, Parti Ouvrier formed, as I say, as a kind of section in, in 1880. Um, by 1882, it had formally split from the French Socialist Workers' Party. Um, in 1893, um, Guide was, was standing for election and was subsequently elected. Um, what's interesting about that election in 1893 is that one of the things that has stood as a kind of shadow over the French Communist or the French Socialist Party in its foundation was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Um, Guide was frequently uh, accused of being uh, a, a stooge of the Germans, um, uh, French nationalists would um, uh, point to the fact that he had uh, friendly associations with Marx and, uh, and Engels as, as evidence of, of his likely treachery, and, and of course that sounds horribly familiar with the present, isn't it, in terms of the, the, the embrace of, uh, of uh, of patriotism as a feature. Um, so, but the interesting thing about it was that already by 1893, um, Guide in a sense had made a concession to that problem, that question around the relationship between him and uh, the German party, the, the social democrats in Germany. And so, uh, the, the, so it became formally the Parti Ouvrier Francaise in 1893. Although at no point did Guide uh, um, distance himself at all from his comrades in, in Germany, uh, and far from it, uh, 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 made a, a strong appeal to, to internationalism. Um, they merged with the uh, uh, Blanqui section, so once again, uh, Blanqui continues to exert an influence right up until 1902. Uh, the Blanquist uh, Central Revolutionary Committee it merged with um, the Parti Ouvrière Française, um, to form um, uh, the Parti Socialiste de France, uh, the, the, the Marxist bit, before they are finally merged uh, with the Parti Socialiste Française in 1905. And this was the French section of the Workers' International. And actually that merger was, was under the direct influence of the International itself. So let's turn to Paul Lafargue. Um, one of the many interesting things about Guide was that he was not really a great writer. He did write pamphlets and he did write, um, but no one has ever said, suggested for one moment that he produced any kind of output that was of any kind of theoretical standing at all. Um, he, his principal reputation was as an indefatigable fighter for the working class. Uh, although he came from a middle-class background, he um, lived in, in pretty much dire poverty until he was elected as a member of parliament, um, with a, as a deputy to the, the, the National Congress. Um, Guide uh, was... Uh, so... Uh, a close associate of Paul Lafargue, and, and Paul Lafargue himself was, was a far, far more uh, capable writer. Uh, he was born in Cuba uh, to, of mixed ethnicity, uh, in, born in Santiago de Cuba, and he married Laura Marx in, in 1868 at St Pancras Register Office last week, um, uh, and was supported financially, uh, they both were, were supported financially by Friedrich Engels. Um, in their work uh, in, in France. They did a great deal to uh, translate much of Marx's work into French. Um, uh, Paul Lafargue wrote a nice little essay called The Right to be Lazy, uh, and it's available on the Marx Engels Internet Archive, and it's um, well worth a read. It's very entertaining, apart from anything else. Um, you can go through it line by line as a, a, it critically, but what it crucially points to is the critique of wage labour the critique of wage slavery. And from that point of view, Lafargue was very much firmly in the Marxist camp and uh, does it beautifully, uh, you know, a very accomplished writer. Unlike Guide, uh, Guide uh, was, was known primarily for his, uh, as, a, um, as a magnificent speaker and as someone who defended the interests of his constituents um, with, with the, the, the fullest passion. Uh, not initially, he didn't spend a lot of time in his constituency initially uh, and, and, and lost the election, but when re-elected, re uh, he was an indefatigable fighter for, for the, particularly the textile workers in his constituency. So the right to be lazy is, is worth a read. Um, uh, 
Paul and uh, Laura Lafargue, uh, Marx Lafargue, uh, died in a suicide pact tragically in uh, 1911. Um, it's, as far as I can make out, uh, Lafargue simply felt that there was nothing more he could add to the workers' movement and simply felt his life was hopeless, which is extraordinary, really, uh, given how much they had achieved. Um, but Lenin, who was um, an exile in Paris at the time, spoke at their funeral. So this is Jules Guy, probably the most influential single figure within the French Socialist Party. Uh, born as Jules Basile, uh, he chose to use as his pen name his mother's name, uh, Guy. Um, and he, he was a civil servant. He, he, he worked at the Interior Ministry. Um, but later on, it, it, the important thing to, to understand about Guide here is his uh, development, his political trajectory, as it were. He started off really as a radical Republican. I mean, remember, this is the time uh, of the Second Empire uh, under Louis Napoleon. And he, he was writing for Republican newspapers during the Second Empire. Uh, and, um, and because of that, uh, he ended up as a refugee in Geneva. So he was a radical Republican, uh, more influenced by Proudhon than anybody else. And he, even later on, um, uh, was was kind of reticent about the whole idea of taking part in electoral politics and was criticised by that, uh, for that, by Marx, uh, for his so-called revolutionary phrase-mongering. And he was elected as MP for Roubaix in uh, 1893. Um, Roubaix was apparently spoken of as the, the, the Manchester of France. It was a, a important center for textile production and uh, many of the workers were subject to, to great poverty. Uh, and Guy uh, spent, was, was a national figure. So initially he didn't spend a lot of time in his, in his constituency, but, but worked extremely hard. But having become a Marxist by 1876, now this is an important, uh, uh, caveat to add to that, although he, he was a Marxist, he didn't know Marxism terribly well. Uh, he he was wholly unschooled in, in dialectics. He, he wasn't a great uh, one for having uh, plowed through capital and, and, and many other texts. Instead, he relied largely upon popularized versions, and he was a great popularizer uh, of Marx and a great speaker, uh, but not known for any kind of theoretical development. Um, Having been an anarchist, having been opposed to taking part in electoral politics, not only did he become an MP for Roubaix, but he also subsequently um, uh, supported the uh, Union Sacre, uh, the, the union of, of effectively workers and the bourgeoisie in the, at the outbreak of the First World War. There was at no point any attempt on the part of Reed uh, to try and prevent uh, war credits being voted through for the for the French Republic uh, to, to wage war uh, against Germany. And, um, and, and by 1917, although, at, at, and he'd begun his life as a radical Republican rather than as, as, as an anarchist or as a, uh, as a Marxist, uh, warmly welcomed the February Revolution, but did not support workers' councils, did not support the Soviets, did not support the Bolshevik Revolution of October 1917. Um, I won't dwell upon the Dreyfus affair, a lot of people will be fully aware of it. Um, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, those are his dates, um, uh, was from Alsace and uh, because of the upheaval of the Franco-Prussian War and the loss of Alsace line uh, to Germany uh, and the trauma that that, that, that caused him, he, he joined the army in 1877. Um, Effectively, he was framed uh, for treason uh, of supplying um, secrets to the, to the Prussians uh, and convicted of treason in, in, in 1894. What's important here is that he polarised the nation. And you see this famous uh, um, uh, newspaper in front of you, La Aurora, uh, where uh, by then, an enormously famous writer, Emil Zola, uh, published La Jacques, um, a, a, a damning indictment of uh, the anti Semitic uh, victimization of Dreyfus. Now, 
what this posed, of course, was one of the great contradictions at the heart of capitalism, one of the great contradictions at the heart of the French Republic. On the one hand, uh, to be a citizen of a republic is to own yourself. And as a citizen of a republic, how you have formal equality with all other citizens of the republic, unless you're Jewish. And that contradiction at the heart of, uh, of the Dreyfus affair, that contradiction at the heart of the Third Republic, uh, meant that um, it, it caused a, 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 a fracture in French society which polarized people into Dreyfusards and anti Dreyfusards. And the strange thing, uh, and bizarrely, uh, it was not supported by Yid. Um, his uh, biographer, uh, who I've recently read, uh, Jean Numa de Conge, um, is somewhat charitable in suggesting that one of the reasons why Guide um, didn't necessarily support Dreyfus uh, was that he, of his general kind of antipathy towards the regular army, which had, after all, uh, crushed the commune. The, a less charitable interpretation is that although Guide was in no way anti Semitic and had written uh, uh, condemning anti Semitism, he was sensitive to the anti-Semitism that was out there among his constituents, and from that point of view, chose not to engage in a fight which might have affected his political career. Now, um, I don't know enough uh, to be able to decide one way or the other, but it's very strange that Guide uh, didn't support Dreyfus in a way that Jean Jaurès uh, did. Uh, despite the fact that Jurez uh, was a, in a sense, far, far closer to the possibilists uh, than, he, than he was uh, closer to Guide. Um, if ever you wonder what happened to poor Alfred Dreyfus, he was not released until 1899 as part of a pardon, uh, but that didn't uh, exonerate him. And he wasn't exonerated until 1906, when it was discovered who the likely culprit was who had been passing secrets. Uh, um, a major who had uh, escaped and, and fled to England. Um, Dreyfus subsequently served throughout the full length of the um, First World War and retired uh, from the French army as a lieutenant colonel uh, before dying in 1935. Jean Jaurès uh, occupies a huge uh, place in the history of the French Socialist Party. Uh, he originally came from uh, a, a bourgeois family uh, in the south. Uh, Tarn is down in uh, uh, Languedoc, the, the Occitane uh, area of France. Um, it was originally a again a republican. Remember, you know, in the early part in the, in the period at, coming out of the the Second Empire into the Third Republic, um, the the the, uh, the the question at hand was you know uh, the possibility of a restoration of the monarchy and. Um, Jurez was a Republican deputy for Tarn, and then subsequently elected in for the same uh, département in 1893 as a socialist. Um, what distinguished him from Guy, among many other things, was his approval of the participation of socialists in government. Uh, not only was Guy uh, a, 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 was Guy was initially opposed to even standing as a candidate for, for elections, but um, it was certainly opposed initially uh, to the idea that one might participate in government. Uh, Jure has also founded L'Humanité, which uh, still exists notionally, and as a, well, at least the at least in name, uh, as the party of the French Communist Party. Uh, and by 1905, uh, under the pressure from the uh, Socialist International, uh, the two socialist parties united uh, and led jointly by Jurez and Guide. Interestingly. Jurez was opposed to both militarism and imperialism. Guide at times was somewhat lukewarm about imperialism and, I, and at one point had written uh, um, criticisms of the use of Chinese workers to un undermine um, uh, French workers' wages uh, rather than, say, calling for um, uh, those Chinese workers to be fully part of the, the French working class and and uh, and have full trade union rights along with everybody else. Um, so, and it's an interesting feature that we'll come on to in a moment of the Second International, of an ambivalence towards uh, colonial questions, uh, a, a failure really to um, understand the exploitative nature of, of imperialism. 
So Jaurès was opposed to mili both militarism and imperialism. Uh, one argument is that Guides really didn't oppose militarism that much or didn't think it was, a, a, was, a, was imp an important enough issue to worry about. Um, and Jaurès, despite being supposedly a, a, a more moderate uh, socialist and more moderate Republican, uh, supported the idea of, of a mass general strike to stop the possibility of war. And as we know, the Second International was uh, in large part um, shaped by the growing storm clouds of the First World War. Uh, Jean Jaurès, just on the eve of the outbreak of the First World War, was assassinated by a, a nationalist, Raoul Villain. And extraordinarily, although he was imprisoned for the duration of the war, when he wasn't tried until after the First World War, and he was acquitted, having put two rounds directly into the back of Jean Jaurès. Um, he did get his comeuppance in 1936 when he was shot by Spanish Republicans. Um, this isn't a place to do a, a full number on um, uh, Second International. I just want to point out uh, the distinctive figure of Rosa Luxemburg here at the 1907 Stuttgart conference. Um, if anyone wants to pour over this picture later and, and, and try and spot who, whoever other leaders there are. Um, the Second International, in a sense, it, the, the, the first meeting of the, the attempt to establish a Second International um, was effectively with, with two conferences, uh, one, one of possibilists and one of Marxists taking place. The reason why there were two was because um, uh, the British Trade Union Congress insisted that delegates should have their credentials, their names should be recorded and the credentials of, of who they've represented and how they got there uh, should be recorded. Well, for, for example, uh, Marxist members of the German Social Democratic Party, um, they would have faced imprisonment on return to Germany. Um, and many other Marxists were operating under conditions of illegality as well. So this was an insufferable condition placed on it by the, uh, by the British Trade Union Congress. But arguably, this is also a, a, a way of that Hindman was using uh, to distance Marxists from the workers' movement. Um, and uh, I'll have the honor of giving Hindman a good kicking next week. Um, so uh, by the 19, uh, 1896 Congress in London, uh, there was a, 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 a strong uh, reformist fact and revolutionary factions within the Second International. The Second Congress of, of, of the International was 1891 in Brussels and was the first kind of um, unified co Congress of, of the International. Um, the 1896 Congress was uh, notable, among other things, for excluding anarcho-syndicalists. And as I say, we'll come on to syndicalism later. But it was the international that had pressurized the, the, the two sections of the, the French Workers' Party uh, to, um, to unite. And of course, in 1907, Lafargue, uh, along with many others within the Stuttgart Congress of the Second International, affirmed their anti-militarism and determination uh, not uh, to pursue a fratricidal war between the workers of Europe. So in conclusion then, um, I just want to, put it into some sort of context. Uh, it seems to me that the, you know, the, the, the familiar narrative that we, we, we hear is that um, maybe the Bolsheviks could have pulled it off if only, if only, if only. And typically that if only is if um, the opposition of the German SPD uh, to war credits had been uh, solid, and stuck to the principles of the Second International in 1914. But just a minute, neither did the French. Uh, Guide not only uh, supported the war, but took a ministerial position uh, during the First World War. Uh, for all of the social democratic parties, for all of the parties of the Second International throughout Europe to fail so miserably, this is something which requires something more of an explanation than merely um, the betrayal by a leadership. Uh, this, this, I don't think, as a, as an explanation, as Mar it doesn't sound a very Marxist explanation for a start uh, to say it was down to the betrayal of of, a, of of leaders in in this or that party, as it seems to have been a European wide uh, feature. Um, only the Independent Labour Party 
uh, in Britain opposed the war and quite often on a pacifist basis rather than an internationalist one. Um, the French party went along with it and so did most of the others. Um, so in considering La Belle Epoque, uh, of 1880 to 1914, here is a period in French history in which despite the loss of Alsace-Lorraine, two of the most uh, industrialized uh, and areas rich in coal supplies, for example, and that's why they were uh, seceded as part of, that's why they were ceded as part of the, uh, the, the war reparations demanded by Prussia. Um, you have a period of extraordinary prosperity uh, of, uh, transformation in, in industrialization, the invention of, of machinery to completely transform production. And you have a significant rise in the standard of living, a change in the empirical nature of the class structure. Of course, um, the overwhelming majority of the population were still uh, either peasants or, 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 or proletarians. But you also have the, a, a rise in imperialism, and you generally have an, o, o, an overall rise in the standard of living, even if the very poor, uh, as we see today, uh, the very poor uh, find themselves in, in a static position or even getting worse. Uh, by contrast, there was a growth in a kind of new middle class, uh, the development of a labour aristocracy. Um, and uh, arguably that labour aristocracy on the back of um, imperialism itself and there is an interesting question as well about the change in the way in which surplus value is extracted from the working class in most of the debates we see constant references to a demand for a 10-hour working day for an eight-hour working day of course Paul Lafargue is arguing in the right to be lazy for the abolition of wage labor and rightly so um, but nevertheless uh, we're seeing a reduction in the working day and a change in the way in which surplus from the absolute surplus value of ex simply extending the working day to increase the amount of surplus labor uh, to a cheapening of the goods with which workers consume and in no small part because of their importation from overseas and the colonial possessions and uh, the use of machinery to, to, to cheapen production of wage labor goods uh, of, of, cons of consumer goods. So you see a transition from absolute to relative surplus value uh, so we tend to think of the period in the run up to the First World War as being a period of, of great poverty. But yes, it was. But it was also a period in which at least some people were seeing marked improvements in their standard of living. So comrades, um, that's a, a, a rough and ready introduction to uh, the, 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 the development of a, of a French Workers' Party. Uh, I look forward to discussion and comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, could you stop screen share, please? So, Thank you. Comrades, if you have any questions or would like to make a contribution, please click raise hand. And perhaps we could uh, make a little start, as always. Um, I think it's interesting. There is a, there is a discussion, isn't there, between Lafargue and Guide, if that's how you pronounce it, and Marx about the program to what it, it develops after a while in that Marx um, outlines it as a, as a, as a maximum minimum program where you have the maximum, which is communism, basically socialism. And then you have the minimum demands, which in my understanding and, and how Marx meant it is steps that we can take in the here and now that arise from the workers' struggle, um, but go also beyond it and go right to the edge of what capitalism can uh, theoretically uh, deal with and could allow us if we fight for it, et cetera. And that, you know, we should fight for those minimum demands with the maximum demand, the maximum program as the path to communism. So the, you know, just two parts um, as opposed to the transitional uh, program, which, which Trotsky developed. But from for, so for Marx, there was a question of fighting for these minimum demands, getting the working class to, to take them up and get them to the point where, you know, the, the logic of capitalism is challenged. And then Lafargue and Guide, um, and that's where that famous quote comes in, isn't it? Um, if that's Marxism, I'm not a Marxist. 
uh, Lafargue and Guide disagreed with that kind of uh, interpretation of it, as I understand it. They thought it was more like a, a trick to get the, the workers on board. Can you can you expand on this a little bit more? I think it's important to, to, to draw a distinction between the kind of opportunist demands that the po possibilists were putting forward. The possibilists were putting forward demands um, that were not dissimilar to the kind of minimalist demands that might be put forward by the Marxists, you know, reduction in the working day or whatever else. Um, but uh, they were doing it without the, any kind of notion of, of a maximalist program. Any kind. So uh, it, it's interesting that the maximalist part of, of, of Marx's program is right at the very beginning, it's right in the preamble. This is about the revolutionary overthrow of, uh, of the exploitation of labour. And what then follows is a series of demands which, which tests the um, ability of the ruling class to make any kind of concession whatsoever. I mean, we live in an interesting time, don't we, where uh, even the concessions to of uh, some sort of mild left Keynesianism appears to present some kind of huge challenge. Arguably, it doesn't at all. But um, then at that time i mean these were really radical demands in terms of uh, of, uh, of, e uh, of equal rights and equal pay for women um or, of of uh, universal uh, suffrage uh, and all you know long before um other european parties had gone anywhere near it so this i mean i don't think any of the kind of um minimalist demands uh, just like in the, the 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 communist manifesto i don't think any of the the minimalist demands that marx was putting forward would were in any way uh, uh, contradictory to the to the to the revolutionary demands but they were um you you said it in a way like the the, the minimal program program was to test test the capitalist class wasn't that how um Lafargue and Guide sort of saw it. I was like, um, you know, these these demands will never be met. They can't be met. It's more like, you know, to to trick you. Whereas Marx had in mind that these demands come out of the working class movement and they are utterly achievable. And of course, they kind of yeah. were. I mean, these, these were demands that were already being put forward by workers, mm. uh, and and Marx quite properly gave them expression. Um, mm. But 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 I mean, even if you um, just you know just uh, pluck out um, uh, just just one at random abolition of all indirect taxes and transformation of all direct taxes into a progressive tax on incomes over three thousand francs. Um, we we're living through a period in which uh, we've we've seen um, a huge concentration of wealth in the hands of very few people. Uh, it, it, and 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 here, Marx is putting forward something which is a um, a, a, a directly redistributive uh, program, and you can see how uh, the ruling class are not going to concede that. But just as today, uh, politicians are, are frightened to even mention anything possibly uh, um, redistributive. I mean, I think Guy, the, the problem Guy has, he's really just saying uh, we need to go. And just stand on the on on revolution alone, and that's why um, Marx uh, regarded it as, as revolutionary phrase mongering. Uh, he he recognised that you actually have to address the the the, the demands of workers directly. Um, yeah. Mm. So but today, then, I mean, because we're doing this series also to to try and learn some lessons for today. I mean, there are a lot of. Marxists around, you know, I'm thinking of Socialist Workers' Party, Socialist Party, etc., who reject the minimum maximum idea um, and say, you know, oh, that's that was just a, a phase, and you know, worse, it, it perhaps it led automatically to the second international, uh, sorry, to the first international, the betrayal of the first international, basically, the, the minimum maximum uh demands. And instead, uh, the transitional pro program of of Trotsky would be more appropriate and there's hardly any organizations around that still sort of stand for a minimum maximum program how do you see the difference between those two approaches and what kind of approach you know would be useful for today one of the things that's interesting is Guide was partly responsible for Trotsky being exiled <laughs> kicked out of France <laughs> um I think that 
the difficulty I have today with with with, with references to um, a transitional program is is that the the idea of revolution and the transformation to a different sort of society seems in the almost indefinite future. I think it has to be linked to the. I think, in a sense, that there there are almost no more compromises that could be made. It has to be linked to a um, a, 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 a revolutionary demand. One of the things that, that hasn't changed is just that little bit in the um, uh, in 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 the preamble where where it's about um, where it talks can can only take place uh, uh, under the. the the, the, the revolutionary transformation of society. And whilst left groups of one sort or another are very keen on talking about revolution, they're not necessarily talking about what the socialist society would be like. And so you end up with um, lots of references to the dictatorship of the proletariat or whatever. Um, and precious little about the abolition of wage labor, precious little about what, what a, a socialist society would actually be like. Um, uh, and, I th and I think that's one of the major problems that we face. Mm. Or there's sort of rather vague references to socialism, which often is then, in their view, also different from communism. Communism is the, the bad. And, 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 and socialism, in, in some, I mean, we always have to redefine what it is we mean. I mean, socialism in a lot of people's mind just means nationalisation. Mm. Uh, and Exactly. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't have too many kind of very positive memories of, of nationalisation, particularly. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it sometimes has to be done. You know, if if um, but it, it, for for particular reasons uh, and with 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 a particular program in mind. And you know, in the event of a revolution, we can know with great certainty that the banks would collapse or whatever. Well, then they have to be nationalised without without compensation it's as simple as that mm -hmm. um that can only be done in a revolutionary situation so nationalization is not socialism but it is a step and, and i think all uh, writers of any note have, have, have made the same point yeah richie richie rich runs the you know the banks or directly or what's what's what helps that going to be to us um one one question though i would like to discuss qu quickly well quickly if we can is the the question that's been in the chat um you mentioned the dreyfus uh, affair um and the issue came, came up about marx being accused of being anti-semitic which was based on his on his um early essay on the Jewish question. This is not part of today's, um, you know, you haven't studied it so much, but if you know anything about that, um, you know, I, what I know is, no, he wasn't anti-Semite, it, was it wasn't a great, it wasn't a great essay, essay but he was actually replying to uh, Bruno Bauer and who rejected the idea of emancipation of Jews and, and Karl Marx argued in favor of it. And in the process sort of made a few, Remarks, which you know, if you want to read anti-Semitic stuff into them, you you can, but it's more like um, you know, if 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 this is a if you, if we're arguing for emancipation from money or emancipation from you know capitalism, then that's a good thing that the Jews should be emancipated from that. So that's that's as far as I know. But do you know anything more about that? That well, Marx came from a rabbinical family. Uh, you know, his his grandfather was a rabbi, uh, and his his father only converted to Lutheran Christianity to, because he would otherwise not have been able to get a job in the, in the civil service. Um, the, the, the Jewish question in the context of, of, of Marx, I think Marx was aware of, of Jewish history. And those who are familiar with Abraham Leon's book will, will see, you know, that's the kind of thing that Marx was referring to, the fact that the, the, in, in the ancient world, in the medieval world, um, the Jewish population constituted of what Abraham Leon calls a nation class. And from that point of view, his Marx is where Marx is making an association between capital and, uh, and, and Judaism is, is, is only really a reference to that. He's not, not what he's not doing is that the, the socialism of fools, which you see with um, Proudhon and the others who, who associate um, um, people like uh, the, the Rothschilds or whatever, uh, as being representatives of capital and therefore are anti-Semitic on those grounds. Hmm. Okay, let's bring in some people from the floor. Uh, Steve Freeman was first. Hello. Hi, 
Athena. I'm going to mute myself first of all. Uh, thanks, Ian. That was very good, very interesting. Um, and I was thinking a bit about this today, and I want to go back to what Tina was saying, and I want to go back to a theme that I push because I think it does make a certain amount of sense that the split is going, the, the, the fight that is going on around this, this time is between what I would call the anarcho-communist, people who are communists who believe that anarchism is the way to get to communism. And those, some, sometimes those people, the anarcho-communists, may, may be termed ultra-left, they may even call themselves Marxists. But if they're Marxists, Marx would say, that's not the kind of Marxist that I'm talking about. And I think that's the context for his phrase. And then I'd say the Republican communists and the Republican communists believe that you must replace the existing state by a democratic republic. And so in Republican communists, you have the minimum program, the Republican program, and the maximum program, the communist program. And that makes it absolutely crystal clear what they're talking about. Marx is talking, Jeremy Corbyn didn't have a minimum program. He had a reformist program tinkering about under the constitutional monarchy, trying to restore the 1945 uh, social contract. That's reformism because it relies on the existing democracy that we've got. It's not a minimum program, which is the Republican program. And so when Marx used the term Republican program, um, He's talking about things that can be achieved. They are absolutely achievable. He didn't say, we'll put these forward as a sort of way of, as Tina already said this point, but he needs re-emphasizing. Um, uh, Gide and them, what, what did, they wanted to put forward demands that were unachievable. And when the workers fought for them, the workers would wake up one day, right, like, like an anarchist throwing a bomb. You know, if he threw a bomb, that would wake the working class up with the big explosion, and then the working class would see their true interests and all that sort of nonsense. And, and the idea of putting forward things that can't be achieved is the idea the working class will wake, will wake up, the stupid workers will wake up and see this cannot be achieved, and then the, the light will go on in their heads and they'll suddenly realize we must have communism. That was not Marx's approach. Marx's approach was Republican, we can achieve these things, and when we've got our democratic republic, if that, that is not communism, but it's way on the way on the road towards it. We're, we're right down the road if we can achieve those things. And so when you look at the, um, the programme, um, that, that, Ian, that you showed us, and it's very interesting, it, the only way you can look at that, those, the political section the five demands in the political, they're democratic demands. They are demands which are essentially the, about the commune and the republic and, and abolishing standing armies and the general arming of the people. The general arming of the people is a republican demand. Just say the general army, just the workers, by the way, of the people. Uh, it then speaks about the abolition of all laws over the press meetings, associate, you know, association, so all those, but, but it's basically a democratic and republican program. And even when you look at the economic section, they're all things that are quite achievable. It's, it's in the same spirit. If you look in the Communist Manifesto, you can see that same sort of idea there. And that's what we have done. It's not a reformist program in that sense. It is to overthrow, really, the consequences are to get rid of the third republic that France had in this time and have a properly democratic republic. That was the essence of the argument. And I think Jean, if I could just say this, Jean Jure, if I can get his name right, they all began as Republicans in the way that you explained. I mean, Jure wasn't a socialist. He was a moderate Republican. Then he became a socialist or became a social democrat, and he became a kind of Republican socialist. So he's, I think, well, I don't think he's. Well, he might be. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure where he's. He's not the same. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was a Marxist. Or I saw him described as being a an unorthodox Marxist. So I don't know whether that might describe him. But I'm really not sure what that means. But he certainly. He certainly had. He certainly called himself a Republican socialist, and he strongly supported the miners in 1892. He he was a, a militant, as you say, defender of Dreyfus and very strongly opposed to the war, which got him killed. It got him assassinated, really, and, and, and that was important. He, I did have one quote from him, which I still think is relevant. He's speaking to the wine growers cooperative 
I don't know what year this was. He said, in the vat of the Republic, prepare the wine of the social revolution. And I thought that's quite good. In the vat of the Republic, prepare the wine of the social uh, revolution. And I think if we get in the vat of the Republic, then we have the wine of the social revolution there for us. So I think that, that you know, I would go back to, to that, that understanding of Marx. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I agree. What do you think, Ian? Is the, the minimum demand is a puts the working class into the position where it become can become the ruling class, really, isn't it? I think it was it was central to it all is property. Um, it, the, the idea that the, the bourgeoisie has to be expropriated. Um, the, I mean, language is important, and of course, we. I don't think we have any kind of principal disagreement. Um, uh, you know, in, in one sense, Marx was the ultimate anarchist. He, he wanted to see the end of the state in all its forms, uh, that it would wither away. But that could only take place when the social relations that make the state necessary have gone. And that can only take place after the working class has taken control. Um, from the, it, I mean, the, the critique of the Gotha program is... is it is it, central to that. I mean, it, 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 there aren't many places where Marx actually talks about what socialism is, but it's quite clear there that there will be a transitional period. Now, if you want to call that a, a social republic, fine, I don't mind. And in a sense, it has a nicer ring to it than dictatorship of the proletariat, which I think is so widely misunderstood these days as, as, as to be a very difficult, you end up with a half hour conversation about what, what he meant by it. Um, but it, um, Engels and when he was uh, throwing his hat into the ring, as it were, with with regard to uh, republican demands, was it was a recognition that the, uh, a, a republic with a universal franchise was the best way in which workers could organise. Uh, from that point of view, a republic is, you know, a for want of a better phrase, transitional demand, um, and, and and a very important one. I mean, I be more than happy to see Charlie Windsor and all his blood-sucking mates out of, on their ear off. But it's it, it's only, but the, the step towards a bourgeois republic is, is you know, it, it, it's the property relations that have to change. It's the exploitative relations that have to change. That's, a, that's what's at the heart of it. What state that then throws up, um, I'd like to think that it was a, the whole point about what, what Marx is arguing for is is, is that the, the di dictatorship of the proletariat or a social republic would be the culmination of, of democracy, not the and he, and he says in in that preamble that it wouldn't be instead of just the 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 the, the, the appearance of democracy, there will be a real fundamental democracy, and it would have to be that direct participative democracy. At what point does it cease to be a republic, except in the sense that? Um, the res publica, the the, the 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 population has control. I, again, I'm completely comfortable with the idea of a social republic, but not with the idea of a bourgeois republic. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Tony, please. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for a very interesting talk about the origins of French Socialist Party and so on. Uh, I come back to a theme, though, that I have often uh, referred to, which is how do we relate what has happened and draw the lessons of what has happened at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, with all the debates about minimum maximum programs and so on, to the situation that we face today with uh, the decline of social democracy, the rise of the far right in Europe, uh, the atomization of the working class, uh, and even the inability uh, of workers and their trade unions to even adopt a minimum, let alone a maximum program. So, I mean, I think there are concrete questions because otherwise we just re retreat into a form of academicism and study of the past without being able to translate that into the present. And that is really the object of history. Uh, which is the translation of, of, of the, the past and how we see it into present day activity. Uh, 
if I can comment simply on uh, both the Dreyfus affair and the question of whether Marx uh, was anti-Semitic or not. The Dreyfus affair was an absolutely massive, it, it was the pivotal event in, in French bourgeois history, without a doubt. It, it, it pitted, if you like, the Ancien regime, the monarchists, uh, the clericalists, uh, the military, those who yearned for a return to the past, the pre-revolutionary situation, and those who wanted to see the development in essence of a, of a bourgeois, a modern bourgeois democratic society. And that was epitomized by Georges Clemenceau, uh, who was prime minister, I think from about 1906 to 1909, who gave his full support. Uh, and it was an incredibly important uh, event. I mean. The Zionists claimed that Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, was inspired by uh, the struggle, the, what had happened to Dreyfus, but that is simply a rewriting of history. There's, Herzl never even mentioned just in his founding pamphlet, the Jewish state, and only mentioned the Dreyfus affair, which I say was a, a, a massive affair in France. I mean, it divided families, uh, it, it pitted uh, people uh, one against the other uh, who were otherwise friends. Uh, and it went on for what, over a decade until uh, Dreyfus uh, was finally exonerated, cleared and reinstated in the army. Uh, as I think a major he was reinstated as, but I, I stand to be corrected. It had, such was the effect of the Dreyfus affair that it, it, it affected French, French society, even during the Vichy period, when, of course, we had a collaborationist regime uh, in part of the unoccupied areas of France. Because although Vichy, which was without doubt uh, anti-Semitic, vehemently so, even the Vichy regime refused to allow the deportation of French Jews who were French Jews from uh, the start. They, they, they handed over refugee Jews in, in France, who I think were the actual majority, uh, but they drew the line at French-born Jews. In other words, the ideas of the French Revolution uh, persisted even under a pro-Nazi quizzling regime. Uh, as regards Marx's uh, essay, it was written when he was very young, uh, politically. Uh, he was uh, heavily influenced by uh, what was probably the first political Zionist, Moses Hess. Uh, uh, and I think it showed, but uh, the kernel of Marx's essay was a materialist analysis of, of, of the Jewish question, uh, without doubt. I mean, he was, uh, he could have chosen some of his phrases more carefully when he asks, for instance, what is Judaism, it's simply Huxterism. But uh, he, he nonetheless did get to the central point of it. The Jewish, uh, Jewish people, uh, albeit that they were changing, which is a, something that I don't think Marx really understood. It, Jewish people had been a trading people and uh, if you like the agents of money within the society that had that uh, dealt primarily in use values, that is uh, feudal Europe. Uh, so, I mean, Mark talked about Jews being the interstices of society. I mean, I don't think he understood that uh, the Jewish people themselves in Europe, and in particular Eastern Europe, Europe were, were being proletarianized. Uh, but uh, that is in passing. But the idea that he was anti Semitic. Uh, really doesn't stand up to scrutiny because the context of what he was saying was a, a call for the emancipation of, of uh, Jewry. Uh, and clearly that in the times was not anti-Semitic, bearing in mind that uh, emancipation only took place in Britain in 1858 and then Germany in 1871. So I mean, Marx was striking uh, a pretty radical tone at the time. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, do you want to respond to some of that, Ian? It's just about the idea of whether it's you know a, a purely academic interest. I, I think the fact that there are how many parties have been founded or organisations have been founded recently, and they and some of them explicitly have the aim of recreating the Labour Party. Um, I, I've lived 
I, you know, I joined the YCL when I was 13, because even when I was 13, I recognised the Labour Party as a as an anti-socialist, anti-working class organisation. Uh, and although at various times I've joined it and worked within it and done all sorts of things, some of which I regret, um, I, <laughs> you know, I think, I think we, 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 as communists, we should talk about communism. I should, and and, I, and I, th I think the interesting thing is that it's actually far more attractive than we give it credit for. You know, what we're seeing today is um, people being told that somehow uh, what, what, what we need is, is, a, is, is a proper Labour Party. And what does that mean to people? What, 1945? When the Labour Party rearmed the Japanese army so the French could get their colonies back or any number of other atrocities that have been performed by the Labour Party over the years. The idea that there was some golden age of the Labour Party. Why would you want to recreate that? Um, ironically, um, there seems that quite a few young people are joining explicitly Marxist organisations, even if some of them leave a bit to be desired, um, whether it's the Young Communist League or whatever else, or Socialist Action or... Uh, anyway, um, I, I, firstly, I, I think no one should apologise for, for an academic study of where we are. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to try and put the French Socialist Party in some sort of context of the Belle Epoque. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not good enough, is it, just to say, well, the reason why we haven't got world socialism is because of Karl Kautsky. You know, across the world, uh, were they all just traitors or were they actually responding to a very real economic situation at the time? Uh, and what's the economic situation we're in now? Uh, so, yeah. Mm. Uh, Thank you. Um, I think we um, you mentioned that some want to recreate the Labour Party. I think some some want to create recreate something even less than than the Labour Party. A left party, I think, is a, a transform. Uh, what it wants to be a party it describes itself um, rather than a socialist party of any kind so it's all very vague and you know redistributing wealth rather than talking about you know <laughs> who owns this stuff not just you know take it from the rich and give it to the poor kind of thing but abolish <laughs> or abolish those those categories or abolish classes but that's not a not in in anybody's um perspective at the moment i think that's why we're studying these issues, aren't we? We're, we're studying, we're going back to Marx because, you know, that was 150 years ago, far more out, you know, perspective, far more insight, far more understanding what the working class can achieve and how it can achieve it. And the left has lost it. The socialist left has lost it. And I think we're studying this to equip ourselves with the way to go about it and to argue for Marxist politics today, even though that seems like really old fashioned. Jesus, he's much more modern than, than some of these, you know, talking about redistributing wealth. It's also redistributing, like it's ever been in the hands of, of the people. So. This is why we're doing that. You know, it does we don't always like concretely say, and that means today in this and this organization we have to fight for A, B, and C, but it should certainly inspire us, I think, to to fight for what is needed and for what is necessary, and not just what you know we might get away with. Or the Corbyn program was ever so popular, you know, that that's why he was um followed by hundreds of thousands of people. So we just recreate that program and then hundreds of thousands of people will follow us rubbish you know this is a misunderstanding of what where, where we are politically i think this is this is this is what we're doing with this this series really isn't it um steve please thanks everybody great about, discussion i'm oh. gonna say what about the oh, other comrades oh sorry sorry not you steve the other steve, steve. oh right okay sorry all right <laughs> fine steve oh, sorry comrade go ahead <laughs> sorry okay um, yeah, Steve Lee from Seattle Revolutionary Socialists and Firebrand in the U.S. And I want to thank you very much for this. It's been a great discussion. I wanted to challenge the idea of the labor aristocracy as a reason for socialist parties uh, supporting nationalism during World War I. I think that um, if you look at it, in many situations in Britain, but also in, in Russia and other places, 
some of the more um, highly skilled and more highly paid workers were actually in the advent or the vanguard of the revolution in certain cases. So I think that it, we should look more to the idea that uh, the generalized prosperity of you know relatively large sections is one idea. Also, the um, commitment of the labor bureaucracy and the political leadership in the parliaments, et cetera, to the capitalist system, as their material connection to that um, is more important. And also just the idea of the ruling ideas of any age are the ideas of the ruling class, according to Marx. And that's, so we can't expect that, we can expect that in a non-revolutionary situation, that the ideas of the majority of people are not going to be revolutionary. That's a tautology, right? So. And leading up to World War One, um, it wasn't a revolutionary situation, so majority of people went along with the nationalism. Um, and so I think those are more of the explanations of what happened um, than the idea of the labor aristocracy. And I think part of the problem is that even today, uh, people with this labor aristocracy analysis, um, it, it undercuts the unity of the working class. In other words, it's important for all sections of the working class to support all sections that is solidarity uh, across all sections. So, of course, higher paid workers should support lower paid workers, but lower paid workers should also support higher paid workers when they go into struggle. Um, and the labor aristocracy thesis about World War I, but even extending to today, I think undercuts uh, the possibility of solidarity. And the other point is that the parties uh, that existed during uh, the main socialist parties were not revolutionary. They were broad parties, and therefore they're more susceptible to going along with nationalism. The party that opposed the war were those that were much more consistently revolutionary. That is the Bolshevik party in Russia, um, a party in Bulgaria, etc. cetera. Um, those were the parties that were able to resist the war. Um, so I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Ian, do you want to reply to a few things? I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not suggesting that the, the, the labor aristocracy alone is, is is a kind of explanation. But it is an interesting feature, for example, in Britain, where you had the formation of, of effectively craft unions that defended their interests against uh, the interests of, of, of unskilled workers. Um, later, when we go into syndicalism, uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a bit more because you know, one of the things that's very interesting in, in the context of, uh, of, of the USA was the development of a mass syndicalist organization in the IWW. And what made them so distinct was, of course, that they recruited unskilled workers, they included, recruited black workers, Chinese workers, and so on. And I think that, that that's a, a, a very important lesson. Um, the, the second international, most of the, there weren't many parties from um, colonial countries, as it were, um, and there, there wasn't much of an interest in the colonial question among the parties of the Second International. Um, you're right, they, they were, you know, a, a general kind of spread of parties, and they quite clearly were not all Marxist. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I just feel that we need an explanation for the total failure across the board uh, of the Second International than simply it was Kautsky's fault or it was the betrayal of leadership. Uh, I think at some point, you know, in in Britain, which lost 800,000 in the First World War, a, a fraction of what the French lost, uh, well over a million, um, uh, conscription didn't even have to be introduced till 1917. People volunteered to go and die in that, that meat grinder. Um, you know, for, for German workers who had enjoyed um, social insurance and various other things, they, I mean, I, you can start to see maybe why uh, the idea of a, a possibilist type program, a reformist type program, the thing that was being put forward by Bernstein and uh, in the context of France by Jean Jaurès was, was starting to be attractive. Uh, and what that led to was a complete failure across the board. Now, either we can explain that in um, economic terms, as it were, or, or what, the failure of the in individuals? I don't know. Indeed. Um, Victor, 
is next. Ooh, I think it's lying in bed. <laughs> well, I'm certainly taking things lying down, Tina. You got that much right. And I'd like to offer you and all the comrades here greetings from Trier, Karl Marx's home city, where he lived before he went to London, which is where, of course, he later died. His uh, mortal remains are in Highgate, I believe. I've seen his uh, uh, grave bust. And I visited his museum here. One of the striking things uh, in the Karl Marx Museum, which is uh, in the building that used to be his family home, is a map. A map that seems to show that during the last century, most people on earth had lived under a Marxist government. The map shows that Marxist rule extended from as far away as Chile in Latin America to Southeast Asia, at least half of Europe, and most of the Asian landmass and parts of the African continent as well. And looking at that map and leaving, and looking at the world's political map today, one can't help but ask, how and where did it all go wrong? I think that's a reasonable question. And give credit where credit's due. I think Tony almost touched on it in his opening remarks on this show. And I want to go into it further because I think it's a crucial question that should focus all our minds if you're, if you're a Marxist. I think the answers include, and, uh, and they're multifaceted, include the fact that the left-wing Marxist movement has been largely co-opted and infiltrated by the capitalist classes and its agents. Many of them have become collaborators. Hence, we now have a Blairite Leno party that's run by somebody who belongs to a uh, secret capitalist organization called the Trilateralists, who somehow or other got elected and has moved it to the right of the Controtatives. Quite an achievement. And we've seen other so-called left-wing organizations veer off to the hard right. Also, tactics have changed. The successful tactics that the the original Marxists and communists used was one they remembered a variation of what one American president said. He said, it's the economy, stupid. Well, we should remember it's the class war, stupid. And that's what Marxism is all about. And that is what we must remember if we are going to win support. But we seem to have drifted away increasingly from the concept of fighting the class war, drifted into the race war, uh, the sex war, the uh, trans war, and all these other side issues, which may be very important to a small minority of people, but they're not the big issue that's gonna mobilize the mass working class. And if we're going to win, we need to mobilize the mass working class. It's interesting that these side issues are all being sponsored by the big banks and the multinational corporations. Also, of course, in order to achieve the first revolution in 1917, the communists collaborated with socialists like Kerensky, with some people who were far right, in order to get rid of the Tsar. The establishment has not only managed to get Marxists to do its dirty work for it by dealing, by using them to attack 
opponents on the right, but Marxists nowadays even attack each other for belonging to the wrong Marxist faction. We see factionalism with the SWP and so forth, attacking other socialists. And then, which perhaps answers Tony's point as to why the far right are doing so well, when it comes to an election, they then say, well, forget all the Marxist stuff we taught you. We want you to vote Starmer to keep them Tories out, which is a complete sellout. It's resulted in the Socialist Party in France being sold out. It discredits Marxists and it leads to the far right being the people who seem to have most credibility. That's where it all simply goes wrong. If I can finish on one point, and I noticed that uh, you were unkind to Attlee, who led our most socialist government in living memory. Okay, no British government has had a foreign policy that we'd entirely approve of, but I think we've got to credit Attlee with the idea of a health service that's totally publicly owned, nationalising electricity, nationalising railways, nationalising coal, nationalising steel, nationalising the greater part of the economy, total public ownership, none of this Blairite PFI sham stuff. And also we had an economic system where tax rates were such that the poor were getting richer and the richer were getting poorer and the gap between rich and poor was shrinking despite the worst e economic situation at that time. Sadly, since his type of socialists have left the field, things have got worse. I apologize for tea now, I've obviously bored of it. Good evening, comrades. Well, thank you, Victor. No, I sort of disagree with uh, quite a few things you've been saying, to put it mildly. I think uh, we think that these were Marxist states. I don't think there was any state that was a, a Marxist state. It was Stalinism. And I think probably Marx would have used that to say, if that's Marxism, I'm, I'm, I'm no Marxist, me, me neither. Ian, do you want to respond to a few things? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes people on the left are uh, almost contractually obliged to be optimistic. But here's some reasons for being optimistic. Um, I no longer have to have debates with people about what the nature of the Soviet Union is. Uh, the Soviet Union was was in no sense socialist, and and actually neither was the Labour government of Attlee. Um, it, it was quite extraordinary when I lived in the Soviet Union as a as a language student. Um, I, I never actually met a socialist, a bar one. I think I met one bloke who would be recognisably socialist, um, and he was one of the blokes that taught me at, at uh, the Pushkin Institute. Uh, I remember having conversations with people who were members of the Communist Party of Russia, uh, who were anti-Semitic, they were just racist, they were nationalist, and all sorts of terms can be you know, justified by uh, left-wing sounding rhetoric. On the question of, of, of Attlee and Labour governments, the, the redistribution that ever took place under a Labour government was usually from one section of the proletariat to another. It was never ever from the bourgeoisie to the proletariat, never, uh, at no point. It, it, yes, there was a, a, a narrower gap between rich and poor in the period up until uh, the, the late 1970s, but it was a, a gap that had been widening ever since the, the start of the First World War. Without the, the, the actions of the Labour government of 1945, there would have been no Vietnam War. There would have, it actually took us into the Korean War. Um, it, you know, um, the, the NHS was really the, the nationalization and rationalization of the NHS that existed before the NHS, which was the, the, the poor law hospitals, the asylums, uh, and also the nationalization of, of, uh, of some private hospitals, but, uh, but, but mostly the charitable institutions, which were falling apart anyway, and had actually been de facto nationalized even before the Second World War because of the need to deal with war casualties. Um, that's another debate, and next week you'll be delighted to know we'll be uh, examining the record of um, the Marx and Engels and the British socialists. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Steve Freeman wants to come back. To the debate. What I really wanted to make the point was that um, 
going back to an article on some people think that what we need to do is to make propaganda for communism and if we keep telling people the good news that communism represents and all the good things that communism will bring eventually people will come to see the light and they'll wake up to that and it's like saying well if workers want a wage increase, we should tell them, we should go to the people and say, no, you're wasting your time because under communism, we'll have abolished wages. So why are you wasting your time going on strike for higher wages? When the answer to this is, let's get rid of the wages system altogether. Now that propagandist approach is not really a class, is not a class struggle approach. Marx's idea of a minimum and maximum program is a class struggle approach to politics. If we're gonna conduct the class struggle in the here and now, we need a minimum program. And the minimum program is a Republican program. It's not the kind of program that Jeremy Corbyn put in front of people, which failed. That was a program of reforming our constitutional monarchy, accepting it, by the way. And, and, and I know that you did a little throwaway, Ian, line where you said, um, it's not, well, you know, of course you want to get rid of Charlie Windsor, but in a sense, our point is that's to really miss the point about it. it's a Republican program. It's not a single issue campaign against Charlie Windsor. If you want a single issue campaign against Charlie Windsor, go along to the Republic organization because that's all you'll get from them. It's the point about the crown, which is the city of London, which is the power of the state which is all the undemocratic and unaccountable, massive, massive power, billions of pounds worth of money in, 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 its, in its coffers, as it were, tax money, printing money, all the rest of it. That's what we have to deal with. And that's what the Republican program is directed against that. Charles Windsor is like the fairy on the top of the Christmas tree, but we need to get hold of the Christmas tree. And we, the reason why I have to do that is because we can't change the property relations while the crown state exists to protect them. If we could do it without, if, if we could change the property relations in the way that you argued without, by ignoring the state, then we would have done it already. The point is there's a political barrier to what we want to do. And if we don't challenge that political barrier with a political program, then we can't get to the point of changing the property relations and ultimately abolishing private property, which is what the communist program is ultimately about. And if I could make one other little point in, in respect to Tony, I did, it's not a difference with Tony, but I wanted to emphasize the point from something that Tony said, because it, 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 he, he, he brought up a couple of points that I found quite interesting. But one is, it's no coincidence that Jean Juarez strongly supported Dave Dreyfus and Guide didn't. And it was because Juarez, for whatever his politics, was strongly Republican in his background, and he believed in liberty and equality and solidarity against the reactionaries. And that's the way that Tony exposed that, it, that the mass politics around the Dreyfus affair was between the Democrats, Republicans, people who believed in equality, and the reactionaries who wanted the monarchy and the empire and all those other things back. And, and, and Tony's point about the Vichy was one I didn't know about, that if you were a French Jew, you were slight, because of the values of the French, uh, French Republicanism, you were slightly more protected than if you were a kind of migrant or a migrant Jew just happened to be there, they would have carted you off to the, to the concentration camps. I didn't know that point, but it does, it does say there's something interesting in in that in that culture and it's the culture that we need to get hold if the, the socialist and i'll finish on this point if the socialist movement is going to go forward post corbyn it has to grasp the idea of the minimum program the program of a democratic republic until the left does that and all of these new organizations are not doing that they're all doing what victor did was go back to 1945 and tell us what a grand thing it was that atley introduced socialism in this country and that was Victor's reference. And all these new organizations, Tina, that we're talking about, Transform and all the rest of them, they're all 1945ers. They're not, they're not talking about democracy and they're not talking about democratic change, which is what the working class and people in this country generally, by the way, masses of people know that our democracy is failing and we need to do something about it. They're just not quite sure how. They don't have a minimum program, but they also don't have a maximum program. Yeah, well. <laughs> Neither. Yeah. They have 
I think they call them transitional demands, which um, yeah. Not transition to what? That's that's the well, issue. I mean, j j just a comment. I think, in, in a certain sense, uh, Ian was right. A minimum program, a Republican program, is a kind of transitional program. I mean, it's not an end in itself. Marx didn't see his Republican program as the end. He just saw it as a step on the road to somewhere else. So, in a certain sense, if we use small T as opposed to Trotsky's capital T, mm -hmm. you can think of the minimum program as a transitional kind of program. And, and if you look at Trotsky's right in the 1930s, why well, he put these democratic demands in his program in the 1930s, by the way, as well. Minimum, he put minimum program, minimum demands, minimum Republican demands in his transitional program for France in the 1930s. Quite rightly, of course. Thank you, Steve. Uh, ironically, Steve, you've come out openly as an anarchist. Uh, because, <laughs> because like Bakunin, like Proudhon, you see the problem as being the state. I, I don't see the problem as being the state. I, I see the problem as being the private ownership of capital. But, uh, no, well, but, but, I mean, I'm, I'm not really saying you're a Bakuninist, trust me. I, no, I, no, I, I'm not offended by you saying that. I mean, I, I don't mind you making a political political but, point. I just think it's not true. I mean, it'd be fine if it was true. I'd say, oh, I've been calling myself a Republican. And in fact, I've just found out, thank you, I'm an anarchist. But <laughs> it, it unfortunately isn't true. The politics of Marx was the, the working class must win political power in order to do these things. It's <laughs> the Democracy is the mechanism by which you can change the property relations. If you don't, if the working class does not win the battle for democracy, then it cannot do that. And that's why you have to put the battle for democracy and the fight for extreme democracy at the very forefront of what we're doing. And the left in England doesn't, I forget about Wales and Scotland Ireland, but the left in England certainly does not do that. And that, to me, that's its fundamental error. The form taken by the state is a direct expression of the of, of, of economic relations of production. Sure. And unless you change those economic relations of production, the, the, what, 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 what will change the form taken by the state? I mean, this is Marx's whole point about you have to smash the state. It's not a, smashing the state of itself is, is, is one step along the way. Uh, but it's it's a question of uh, you know, the, the, the state will take a completely different form for a short transitional period. Yeah, that's what we're talking in, about. That's the, what, exactly what I'm talking about, in really. But, but among, among many other things, I mean, you know, working people have to take control of their own workplaces. Yeah, that's also part of it. So maybe we don't disagree that much. Maybe you're not an anarchist after all, Ian. Maybe you're really a secret I, Republican. I think I'll throw, I'll, throw, I'll throw it back at you. I'm an anarchist and you turned out to be a Republican. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> we've I mean, crossed we've, we've both we've both persuaded each worse. other and crossed over in the middle <laughs> mm, get a room you two anyway <laughs> thank you thank you steve um ian there's no more questions or comments from the floor perhaps you could try and sum up as well also the idea of min max uh, again because this is a an important one for from our perspective i think in terms of you know what what kind of program do we argue for and why it's important I mean, as Marxists, we're always on the side of the workers. It's as simple as that. And it's not for some opportunist reason, because we hope to gain a few more votes at the next election or, you know, this, that or the other. Or, or this will mean, you know, um, lucrative positions within the trade union movement, because that's the position we're in at the moment, where trade unions have become little more than specialist branches of human relations departments. Uh, really just carrying out management functions on behalf of on behalf of management um we as communists support workers in struggle why because workers in struggle will liberate themselves ultimately the act of the the liberation of the working class is the act of the workers themselves which is what marx was talking about in the first international so he's not an anarcho communist he's a communist um you know, it, it, it's not as if this is the only revolution. Uh, it, let's wind back a bit. Uh, the English Revolution of the 1640s or the French Revolution. There were lots of people with quite competing different ideologies. People would have fought to defend feudalism because they realised that capitalism meant that they would be dispossessed from the land. And it wouldn't have been expressed in those terms. It would have been expressed in religious terms. Um, we as communists have to start from an expression 
of the social relations of production because they are opaque. One of the difficulties we face is that capitalist relations of production appear to be natural. They appear to be, you know, the, the fact that this computer I'm speaking on has a, a putative value uh, is it, a social relationship. It's not a natural feature, like the fact that it's silver or it's made of plastic or whatever. And it's, it's those social relations of production that have to change before, uh, as part of a, a, a political transition. Um, just as uh, the forms of art or ideology that are thrown up uh, in the feudal period are different to those which are thrown up in, in, during capitalism. So in the future, different ideas will come up. There will come a point where um, people who defended the idea of capitalism will be like the people who would have defended slavery or defended uh, women not having the right to vote. Um, one other thing uh, about the, it being a, a class perspective, it most certainly is a class perspective. And one of the things about the, the um, preamble and, and the, the program of the, of the French Workers' Party that was quite penned by Marx was, was such a huge advance, as far as I can see, um, o over the first international, was there was an absolute recognition that women are in, an intrinsic part of the proletariat and people of other nations. Um, there should have been no basis for a, a, an imperialist perspective among any of the, the countries of the uh, uh, of the second international but we know full well a lot of them were racist a lot of them were prepared to defend the colonialism of their own countries from one point of view that's even more grounds for optimism the, the proletariat has never been bigger uh, women i know in in many parts of the world it's still true that the, the woman is the slave of the slaves but that's increasingly less the case and women are the proletarians alongside the rest of us. Gide, interestingly, um, had friendly relations with Louise Michel, one of the women leaders of the commune, uh, and visited her in prison in the 1880s. So my own feeling is that uh, in explaining the failures of the Second International, we have to do more than just talk about the betrayal of leaders, because there will be many, many more betrayals by many, many leaders in the future, and start thinking about what is the economic basis for socialism and what's the economic basis for the struggle that's taking place at the moment and what should therefore our demands be among others uh, that something has to be done about the laying waste to great stretches of the world which lead to movements of vast numbers of people who are just desperate to even stay alive and the idea that we then have to pick on people that you know, landing in Dover or wherever is appalling. So one of our demands must be the end of the nation state and the, the radical reconstitution of uh, the expropriation of the ruling class in order to develop those parts of the world that are currently being laid waste to. There's, I think a lot, if we don't learn from our history, we are doomed to repeat it. Thank you. That's exactly the point of our series. Thank you for putting it so succinctly, uh, Ian. We're not just talking about history because we've got nothing else to do, et cetera. It is, of course, to learn the lessons, to learn what was working and to also learn what wasn't working and take the bit, best bits from our movement as it existed in history and hopefully move forward on a higher level, et cetera. Thank you very much, comrades, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Ian, for preparing such a fantastic uh, introduction and you're going to do one again next week I hear <laughs> poor man but you're um, that's a, a good thing to when you're preparing something this is how you really learn this kind of stuff and you're doing such a good job we're really looking forward to it it's going to be on the British um, labor movement and Marx and Engels's engagements with the Fabians etc would be an interesting one no doubt see you next week comrades good night <laughs>